Hi everyone, my name is Katie and I am the Interim Director Curator here at the Clark Museum. Today we're going to be checking out our main exhibit that is on the local Chinese community here in Humboldt County. Uh, this exhibit's been up since February and it'll be closing May's Arts Alive. Um, so if we reopen by May, you can come and see it for yourself. If not, whenever we do reopen, um, the next exhibit will be on fishing in Humboldt County. So. We'll keep everyone posted on our closures and when we're gonna reopen. But in the meantime, let's go check out this exhibit. So when you first walk in, the first case you're gonna see is this one. And it talks about um, immigration from China to Humboldt County. So we'll take a look at this map here. So the dark spot, um, down kind of in the southern part along the coast there is where most people, most Chinese people who immigrated to Humboldt County, that's where most of them came from. Um, there were a lot of different reasons why people left uh, China. Parts of, part of it was there was an event called the Opium Wars where uh, Great Britain and the United States to some extent were smuggling opium into China after um, opium was banned by the Chinese government. Um, so that happened, there were uprisings, the government was weakened by everything that was going on, um, there were wars, there was a population boom, there was a famine, there were economic problems, there was a lot of things, there were a lot of things going on. Um, another thing was that in 1849 it was the gold rush happening in California and word got out to all around the world um, and the Chinese heard about California referenced as a place called Gold Mountain. Um, and so there were many Chinese people who uh, came to California to mine for gold, make some money, and then head back to China, um, hopefully wealthier than when they left. And then, of course, others immigrated to get away from the violence. Um, some immigrated to join family members, mostly male family members, in um, the U.S. There were some people's wives that immigrated, but that's kind of less common, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, so, of course, everyone had their own reason for immigrating, and the, the reasons I listed are just a couple of the reasons why people left China um, and why people wanted to go to the U.S. So let's take a look at some of the things in this case. So this is a really cool, this was a really cool find when I was going through the collections looking for this. So this is a hat that, um, you see a lot of times in particularly drawings of Chinese miners. Um, it's a kind of woven hat. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information on if this was one that was used during the gold rush, um, but it definitely matches the style. So I was really excited to find this. I didn't know we had one of these until I went kind of looking for, for something along these lines. And this is a lamp. Um, sorry for all the glare. These cases are very glary. Um, so this is a miner's lamp, so that's a big piece of glass. These would be powered, I think, by coal in some cases. Um, you can see up top here, that's kind of an, uh, a spot for uh, the smoke to come out. The little uh, circular handles on the other side fold, so you could hold it like a lantern walking around in some mines. These are gold pans. Um, something important to note about the gold rush in California is that a lot of people, you know, it started out with people um, sitting in the rivers uh, using their gold pans um, to uh, put water in uh, river soil and kind of sift it around. Um, but then as time went on, there were different operations that picked up that required a lot of capital to build um, and uh, was much more technical than using a pan. Um, so with time, uh, gold mining became a kind of more of an industrial kind of thing rather than one dude sitting in a river with a pan. Um, and that pushed a lot of Chinese miners out of the gold mines and a lot of individual white miners as well. So we got that. Um, this was also, this is a, um, uh, oh goodness. Um, I can't remember the name of it. 
um, I don't remember the name of it, but this was um, used to crucible, that's the name. This was used um, to heat up uh, gold and lead and other items. And then this is a reproduction of the golden spike. So a lot of people, especially now, are starting to learn more about um, the Chinese and their role in building the Transcontinental Railroad. They helped a lot with the, um, the section that was coming from California to Promontory Point in Utah. Um, they were oftentimes tasked with some of the most dangerous jobs, um, blasting holes in mountains to create tunnels, um, all kinds of different things. And they were often the lowest paid um, workers, despite the fact that they were doing the most dangerous work. And they worked on a lot of the railroads and the roads here in Humboldt County as well. And here's a picture from the Humboldt State University Special Collections. Uh, this is one of the few photos we have of local Chinese individuals. Um, so this is a guy using a shoulder pole to carry um, produce from different gardens around town. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, let's see. So as I kind of mentioned, the Chinese um, worked on different roads as well. They worked as construction workers. Um, they built the Panther Gap Road out um, and the road out to Petrolia from Ferndale. Um, want to be sure to mention that. Um, there are other roads that they helped to build, but that's kind of the main one that I've been able to find information on. So there's our introduction to the exhibit. Dun, dun, dun. So after the gold rush, um, the Chinese were oftentimes pushed out of working in the mines, especially if there were large populations of white folks around. Um, so when that happened, and that also coincided with kind of the larger scale industrialization of mining from gold pan mining to um, uh, larger industrial styles of mining that required shooting lots of water at high speeds at the side of a mountain and then going through the rocks that come out of that. That required a lot of capital and um, pushed a lot of people out of the solo mining gig. So when the Chinese were pushed out of that, they came into cities and they started doing all kinds of different jobs. Some of them did stay rural, worked on ranches and farms, um, but others moved to areas like Eureka and established a Chinatown. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the work they did. So over here, this case kind of shows a couple items that represent work that the Chinese workers did. So one of those, of course, was laundry work. And these, um, these irons, this one, and this one, and that one, um, some of them can weigh about 12 pounds. And how these would work is that you'd take your iron, which is made of iron, cast iron, you'd put it on your stove, you'd let it heat up, and then you'd have another one also heating up. And once one of them was heated up, You'd pick it up and you'd iron your clothes real quick. And then as it cooled down, you'd put it back on the stove, pick up the other one and keep ironing. Um, but if you've ever used cast iron, you know that it gets kind of dirty sometimes. So you gotta also be careful to not um, get that on the clothes, especially you know clean clothes that you're ironing. Um, and these irons can weigh about 12 pounds. So you can imagine working in a really warm, humid laundry for you know, 12 hours a day was kind of a common work day, depending on the work you were doing. Um, you know, could even be longer work days. You can imagine how that would be kind of awful. Um, and this was work that a lot of, you know, the white population didn't really want to do. Um, it was hard work, it didn't pay a lot. Um, and so the, the Chinese people up, picked it up. And there were a lot of, um, white people that didn't really like that um, uh, situation, I guess. A lot of people framed it as the Chinese are taking our jobs. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later as well. So we also got a mop bucket here. There we go, that's a little bit clearer of an image. Um, so 
you know, they also worked as house cleaners and um, domestic servants, that kind of thing. We also have a long-handled axe here, and we have a drag saw, which goes all the way there. So we did have Chinese loggers that worked around here. Um, like the railroad work, they oftentimes got the most difficult jobs um, for the lowest pay. And then there's also this kind of really long drill looking thing. So this is a tree drill, and this is one of uh, the tools in the local logging industry that kind of surprises a lot of people. Um, what happened is early on, it was really hard to take down larger trees. There just wasn't the technology to do so. Um, you know, you have these, um, these drag saws, but before those were widely available, it might, you know, it might be kind of hard to take down a tree. So what would happen is um, sometimes it was after the tree was already on the ground. They'd drill into the side of it with this tree drill and they'd stick some dynamite in it and blow it up. And that would break it up into smaller pieces that were a little bit more manageable. And as technology improved, those kind of became less of a tool that was used. Um, this, is also, this is a pack saddle. So there were Chinese workers who worked on pack trains, um, taking supplies from the coast over to the mines, um, the Trinity Mines um, and other ones. So um, here's a pack saddle from that. So usually these would have kind of a, let's see, I guess it would be like a leather or a burlap bag that sits over the top of it and then you'd tie items to that. Um, and that would uh, distribute the weight along the animal and be sure that um, it doesn't rub against the animal in a way that's um, uncomfortable or hurtful for the animal because they had to travel very far to get these supplies um, to where they needed to go. And a lot of people made money working as pack train suppliers um, and general store operators. A lot of times people say those were the guys that actually ended up making a killing on the gold rush, not the miners themselves. So we have a couple of household items here. We got a feather duster, and we got a crock, and we have a silent butler. So these are some of the tools that Chinese workers might have used working as household um, workers. And then up here we have a shoulder yoke, which the the lights are kind of weird to see here. So this is an example of one of those, um, a very similar technology to the shoulder pole. Here's that picture again of the guy with the baskets. So that's kind of a little bit of an introduction to some of the work the Chinese were doing here in Eureka and Arcata and different areas um, around the county. So of course, when people travel, they bring their traditions with them, including clothing, uh, foods, hairstyles, family organizations, and celebrations. Um, one of the earliest mentions of Chinatown comes from 1874, and this is the Chinatown that was located here in Eureka. Um, and that newspaper story was talking about a really large New Year's celebration that the Chinese community was holding, and that includes a lot of firecrackers, um, there are special flowers that people bring around and hand out to different folks. Um, so they brought those, they brought religious traditions and um, all kinds of different things. And the traditions that the Chinese brought looked very, very different from what a lot of local people were used to seeing. Um, and it made it really easy for the Chinese people to be targeted for violence. So here's a case that kind of shows a couple of the items that people might have brought with them as they were traveling to the US and things that might have been imported from China um, for people who already uh, lived here in the US. So a couple things, we got this bottle here. So this is an interesting one. It was purchased um, in Weaverville, which had a really big Chinese population. Um, and they have a very, they have some excellent, or an excellent museum out there. Um, there's a Trinity County Historical Society that has some displays on the Chinese population, and then there's the um, 
oh man, why is the name slipping me? Um, oh, it'll come to me. Um, but it's a state historic park um, that is operated out there, and it's a Chinese temple. It's really beautiful, and the tour the tours there are awesome. I highly recommend them. So here's a little religious figurine. I think, if I'm remembering right, this is a figurine of uh, Manjushri. He's got a sword um, to cut through ignorance, which is really kind of fun to think about. Um, and this is a paper that came with it. I'm not really sure what it says. This is another paper. Um, but this came with the figurine. And then we have this little mini tapestry kind of thing, um, along with some Chinese coins. Now these Chinese coins aren't actually attached to this tapestry, that's just kind of how we displayed them. Um, but they're from a bunch of different people. Some are from Cecile, some are from um, other community members. And let me see if I can try and get a little bit of a better view on this. And so the, the images on this tapestry come from a story, and I'm not very familiar with it, but it, ha it has a bunch of um, symbols for good luck and wealth and prosperity on it. Um, you can even kind of see what kind of looks like a swastika there. That's, um, that's actually a positive symbol in, in this context. Um, it's for uh, luck, I believe. And here's some other figurines. Um, this one's got a lot of uh, soot on it, so I'm assuming that it probably sat on an altar somewhere where there was um, a lot of incense burning going on. Here's another one. This is an interesting one. Um, it's got that halo around it. I'm not sure who this is supposed to be, um, unfortunately, but we got some bottles. So this little red bottle here came with this paper in this box. And we're not really sure what was supposed to be in it. It might have been a medicine. I'm not really sure. Um, we have some dishes and some combs. And one of the other traditions that Chinese folks brought with them when they came here was the usage of opium. And this was a really controversial thing um, for a lot of people in the US, um, which partially had to do with the frequency of usage. So opium was really expensive in China. And um, so it wasn't a, I guess, pastime that people took in super frequently. Um, but being a, you know, intoxicating drug, people quit, like there were a lot of um, local white folks that kind of took it as they're using this intoxicating drug, they're gonna come after our women, they're gonna be all drugged out all the time and not be effective. Um, and there were a lot of stereotypes that came around the usage of opium and Chinese people. So these are some of the opium tools and uh, kind of accessories that we had in the collection. I was surprised we had so many. Um, this is almost a complete setup um, with the pipe and all the different little tools and a tray that all these tools would sit on. Um, here's some other pipes. And, you know, some of these were for opium, but some of them were also used for tobacco. And that was something that a lot of, um, you know, white folks didn't really realize um, that these, you know, weren't only opium. You could smoke other things in these. Um, so opium was banned for commercial sale in the U.S. in 1909, um, partially because um, there were missionaries in the Philippines, which was... Um, under the rule of the United States at the time, um, missionaries were concerned about the trade of opium in the Philippines to people that um, the missionaries were trying to convert. Um, and by the turn of the century, there were a lot of people that thought opium usage was only for the Chinese. But prior to that, there were, opium was widely prescribed to, to women for different women problems, cramps, um, all kinds of different things. Um, and it showed up in a lot of different medicines. It wasn't only a Chinese thing. 
Um, and it was also used for headaches and all kinds of different things. Um, but then by the turn of the century, everyone, most people were saying, opium usage is the Chinese and it's bad and we need to ban it. We need to ban the Chinese. We need to just, bah, you know, um, the whole thing. So, and there were lots of news stories that came out too that were talking about, you know, if you go near these Chinese opium dens, you're going to you're gonna be tempted to go inside, you're going to become addicted, you're going to become a prostitute, um, and then you're going to die. Um, and there were stories of women you know, becoming incapacitated in these opium dens, and oh, the Chinese, uh. And it was a, it was a very widespread stereotype um, and a very harmful one. And the laws against possession and smoking of opium were passed very easily due to these fear-mongering stories and the assumptions of um, the, um, how, the, how opium was being used by the Chinese and how they fit into existing prejudices against Chinese people. So that gives you kind of a little bit of an idea, a little bit of a peek into some of the traditions that Chinese folks brought with them. Um, and we're going to take a look at some other parts of the exhibit next. So of course, when people migrate, they bring their food traditions with them. Those don't just get left behind. Um, with the immigration of the Chinese, we see some interesting material items that are left behind having to do with these uh, different food foods that they brought with them, foods that were imported specifically for the Chinese. Um, and I was surprised that we had this many containers having to do with traditional food and food storage. Um, so let's take a look at that. So we have some chopsticks here, of course, um, from our collection. But the things I really want to highlight are some of these jars. So these are called wine pots. Um, some people say they had wine in them. Um, other people said wine was easily made here, so sometimes this would have uh, more specialty liquors in them that you couldn't easily make in the U.S. Um, here's a ceramic pot that probably held some kind of food in it, maybe. Um, it's got an interesting lid and all these kind of um, ties and things around it um, probably kept that lid on and secure. Here's another one of those wine pots. Um, and these, uh, these are called Chinese brown glazed stoneware or utilitarian brownware. Um, so, and a lot of times when people would use the container, they'd hang on to it and they'd reuse it for something else. So, you know, at one point in time it might have had a liquor, you know, some kind of liquor in it, but then they might have used it for storing other things. Um, here's another one. This one's got a little spout on it. So a lot of people call this a soy sauce pot. Um, in some circumstances, people would use them for tea, although that's not super, super common. Um, there are a couple of other jars around um, that are sometimes called tea jars, and those were used for holding fermenting black tea. Um, but also, you know, there were um, oils, soy sauces, pickled carrots, scallions, salted cabbage, melons, uh, cucumbers, ginger, salty duck eggs um, may have also been transported in these kinds of pots. And then of course they were hung on to and people used them for other things. So also in this case, um, ha this case has one of the um, kind of most more interesting um, text components of this exhibit. And this was picked up from the Trinity County Historical Society. They have the originals, so these are just scans. But these are letters, or this is you know, the envelope, and this is a letter that was written from um, a miner at Weaverville uh, to his big brother. And the text of this, I'll kind of read it out for you. So the, um, the translation uh, kind of reads a little bit easier than the, the direct um, transliteration of it. So I'll read the translation. So this reads, this is to inform my big brother. I, your younger brother, have a problem caused by the behavior of this prostitute, which has been frequently not good. But there is nothing much one can do. Thinking it over and over, I really have no strategies to deal with the problem. I have no alternatives but to plan on returning, and then the translator wasn't sure if it said home in China, soon, as not wanting to stay with her. 
However, I am in debt a lot, which makes it hard to plan anything. Therefore, I am attaching a letter with that of Ku Zhu to you. Let Ah Jing prepare $100 for my boat ticket. I will leave town in the middle of the fourth month. If you have money, letter for home, or any other business, should quickly send it to San Francisco to Lu Yan. I, pick the, I will pick them up. Any delay will not make it. Please hurry up. I beg you, you to understand for lack of details. Thus is my note to you. I wish my big brother good health. 23rd day of the third month of the Wu year. Shi Zhang, younger brother at Weaverville. So the Wu year, um, as the translator kind of goes in to understand, um, the Wu year could either be 1868, 1878, 1888, or 1898. And so the outside of the envelope, read that real quick. So it says, it has two seal marks on the outside, and it says, inside is an important letter. Pray to be opened by Big Brother Lu Pengong at Gu Shou Bar slash Wine Shop from Lu Shi Zhang, brother at Weaverville. And this is something a lot of people get a kick out of reading this letter. Um, but these are the kind of things that I really like to keep an eye out for to really bring the human element into this exhibit and into many other exhibits that we do. Um, this kind of story really brings things to life for people. And then this was another document that was kind of interesting, and this has to deal with burial traditions. Um, so it says here, and this is kind of a little hard to read on the video, so I'll read it out loud. Weaverville, California, August 18th, 1913. Permission is hereby granted for the disinterment and removal of the remains of Mer Mar Ye Lim, whose death occurred 10 years ago at the age of 76 years of a non-infectious disease. The remains to be moved from the Chinese Public Cemetery to San Francisco, California, thence to China. Date signed and permission granted this 18th day of August, 19. 13, Health Officer for Trinity County, California, USA. So it was really important for a number of, for the Chinese workers here that they be buried in China with their ancestors. And there were, um, some of the threats you would see against the Chinese people would be, you know, you're gonna die here and you're gonna stay here. We're not gonna send your body back to China. And that was a very grave threat. Um, against Chinese people here in the county and in other counties. As you can see, this is from Trinity County. Um, this is a reproduction of a document they have. Um, and it was really important that these um, Chinese folks make it back to China. So this was you know, 1913, and this person had died in 1903, and they were just then being taken back to China. So with that, we're gonna go check out the next part of the exhibit. Um, this is on how events in um, Eureka and different parts of the county um, kind of conspired to uh, lead to the expulsion of most Chinese folks in Humboldt County. So we'll go check that out next. So now we're going to be talking about the factors that led to the 1885 Chinese expulsion here in Eureka and later expulsion events. And before I get into this, it's really important to note that the events that happened in Eureka are very, very, very closely tied to other things that were happening nationally. And that's a really fascinating topic to look into, especially because we're considered a very rural area. And the fact that we're connected to these larger you know, nationwide, statewide forces um, is really important to keep in mind in this um, event, as the 1885 expulsion, later expulsion events here and in other places were not isolated. They were connected to a larger um, kind of framework of expulsion, how expulsion should be going on, who should be expelled, um, and things related to that. So we'll take a look at this case. So these are two maps. These are from something called the Sanborn Maps. So Sanborn um, was a fire insurance company. They'd come through uh, different towns in the county and map out buildings and cisterns and things like that for their fire insurance purposes. But these maps are very helpful in seeing how the county changed over time. So here in this map, you can see China Town is right here. 
So this is where, if you're familiar with Eureka, Coast Central Credit Union is at now. Um, so you can kind of imagine, uh, these are photos of the buildings that were in Chinatown. You can see a guy here with his shoulder poles and uh, baskets. So this map was drawn in May 1886, and that was a year and three months after the Chinese expulsion in Eureka. And the buildings were mostly marked as vacant. So I found out recently that the buildings in Chinatown weren't torn down for a couple of years um, after the Chinese were expelled. And that had to do with the guy who owned the land, um, Mr. Ricks, who owned this livery as well across the way. Um, he was concerned that the Chinese would sue him for breaking their lease. Um, and I can maybe talk a little bit more about that later. But anyway, so there's Chinatown. Um, and in the story of the Chinese expulsion, this Centennial Hall, located right nearby, um, becomes a very important location. And this was built for celebrating the centennial of the Declaration of Independence in um, this was built in 1876, of course. The Declaration was signed in 1776. So there's Chinatown. And then in 1889, here's that same block. Notice it looks very different. So this is four years and eight months after the Chinese expulsion in Eureka. It looks very different. All right, so what exactly happened in the Chinese expulsion? We'll talk a little bit about that. I'll put you with this picture of Chinatown. So the Chinese expulsion happened on February 6th, 1885, but it didn't come out of the blue. Um, in the days leading up to it, there were local papers that were noting there was an increase in gunfire around Chinatown. Um, they were attributing it to the Chinese residents and waved it off as foolishness on the side of the Chinese. There was a newspaper story that said, if this continues and the wrong person gets shot, it's gonna be the end of the Chinese here in the county. And that newspaper story um, came out th literally the day before February 6th. Um, so it was really um, ominous kind of, kind of newspaper article. So one of those gunfights that had been happening was the flashpoint of this expulsion event. So on, on the 6th, February 6th, 1885, um, there was a gunshot or gunfight going on in the street and a guy named Councilman Kendall, who I believe was walking to his office from his home, happened to be walking by. There was also a young boy who was walking by um, when gunshots were exchanged and Kendall was killed in the crossfire and the young boy was hit in the foot um, by a stray bullet. He was okay, but Kendall died. And within an hour, word had gotten out about Kendall's death and literally hundreds of people had shown up in the area um, calling for some kind of action to be taken. And so luckily someone was able to round everyone up and send them to Centennial Hall, which was right nearby. And I, I've seen um, estimates of 600 people showing up and assembling at Centennial Hall. And there was a meeting called, um, early kind of um, suggestions on what should be done included uh, burning Chinatown down with all the residents inside. Other ones included rounding up the Chinese and sending them into the forests and whatever happens to them happens. Um, both of those uh, suggestions were shot down by the sheriff who said, I'm here to enforce the law. We're not gonna be getting all doing illegal stuff on this. Um, we need to come up with some other way to um, deal with this issue. And at this point in time, he had arrested about 20 people that they believed had something to do with the shooting. Um, and the local town leadership had sent out um, a version of the National Guard to protect the prison and to kind of just be on hand in case things got out of hand. So at this meeting, what, people, what the um, kind of group decided, settled on, would be the way to go is that a committee of 15 was formed. And that... That committee comprised of many leading local um, folks that you read the list and you're like, oh, crud, I didn't realize many of those names. One of the Boons or Booners was on that list. Ricks was on the list. There was a guy named Bledsoe who was on that list. Um, and that list is actually very easy to get a hold of um, if you look up Chinese and Eureka um, in a variety of different newspaper sources. It's really easy to find that list. Um, so that committee was sent to 
tell the leaders of Chinatown um, that the Chinese had 24 hours to pack up their things and be at the docks for two waiting ships um, to take them back to to take them to San Francisco. And some of these people that were um, told to pack up and leave had lived here for more than 10 years. So um, these were people with established roots in this community that were being sent away, along with anyone else who was Chinese, looked Chinese, um, didn't matter. You, were, you had to be rounded up and you were forced out. Um, and there were groups of people that went into kind of more rural areas. If they found a Chinese person, they told them, hey, you're coming with us. We're taking you to the docks and you're leaving. Um, and one sort of exception, I guess, on this was that there was a guy named Charlie Moon who worked um, on the Bear Ranch. And I'll talk a little bit about him later. Um, but the people who were rounding up Chinese people around town and in these rural areas were really proud of the work they were doing. Um, there were even kids that got involved with it. So within 24 hours, um, the Chinese people had packed up their things. They had gone down to the docks. They took whatever they could carry. They were loaded up onto ships and were sent out to San Francisco. And the people in San Francisco didn't know what had happened in Eureka. Of course, this is a time before electricity um, and you know modern forms of communication. So. The ships arrived at a time when there wasn't anyone really at the docks, so everyone um, came off the boats and kind of disappeared into the city. But that isn't where this story ends. Um, there were a group of Chinese merchants that came together with a guy named Consul B, Frederick B. Um, he was the American consul for China, um, to file a lawsuit against the city of Eureka um, for losses sustained, um, the fact that while people were not killed in this event, they very well could have been because in many, many, many places that tried to kick out their Chinese populations, um, there was a lot of violence that ensued. So they, um, they were suing for a number of different things. And those court documents are available through the Humboldt Room. You can read the whole thing about what people said they lost, what they were suing for, what the city's response was to it. And unfortunately, that case got dropped. Um, for kind of some really confusing reasons. So here's, um, so after uh, Chinatown was cleared out of its Chinese residents, things like this showed up in the paper. So there was a good chance for speculation in Eureka last Saturday. Chinese goods were offered at a terrible sacrifice. We know several instances where cooking stoves almost new were sold for 50 cents a piece. And this was from the Ferndale Enterprise on February 14th in 1885. Um, this was a soy sauce pot that literally says on the sticker on the side, Chinese pottery found at 4th um, and F Street, Old Chinatown, Eureka. Um, and then it was later donated to Fort Humboldt and then later came here to the Clark. And there's stories of people going into Chinatown, finding stuff, taking it, taking over Chinese businesses even and trying to operate them. Um, they, some of these businesses, like the laundries and things, operated at a loss for quite some time um, because white workers um, were historically paid more than Chinese workers and it ended up being really hard to make ends meet. Here's another picture of Chinatown. This one's kind of blocked out by this um, bar in the middle of the case. Um, but you can see Palace Stables is nearby. Um, the person who took this picture or who had this picture at one point was really good about labeling what some of the buildings you see here. So Rick Stables shows up in it. Um, and then here's some like little buildings that people lived in, um, all kinds of things. And this is really interesting. Someone pointed this out to me once. And it, this has to do with how clothes were dried. This is basically a really, really tall drying rack. Um, which is really fascinating. You see this in other Chinatowns all over the place. Oh, and this is really, okay, so this is really an exciting piece that we have on display here. So this is from the Historical Society. This is a arrest ledger. So you can see, and this list continues on the other, on the previous page that you can't see here. Um, but these are a bunch of names of uh, Chinese people who were arrested 
and, and over here you can see implicated in Chinese riot, and then there's a witness. Um, and you can see there's uh, all these names. And a lot of people ask what the ah prefix is in this. So some of it, um, sometimes the ah is translated as Mr. Sometimes it's used as a term of endearment, like uncle, um, to refer to someone who is older than you or higher in status. Um, and then there's other Chinese people that show up in this ledger um, that sometimes their only title is Chinaman. Chinaman. Um, which is pretty darn incredible now that you really think about it. Um, and so the, the kind of the story that everyone says is that February 6th came around, February 7th came along, February 8th, everyone, all the Chinese were gone. There were none left in the city, but there were all these guys. These guys were in prison, um, and then they were released months later, like April 15th. This guy was released um, February 13th, which is actually uh, my birthday, but in 1885. And these guys were released in June, March, May, December. Um, so there were Chinese people still around, and some of them were transported to Crescent City. Um, and yeah, so, and then of course there are Chinese people still in, at the time, there were still Chinese people in kind of the more rural areas that maybe those mobs hadn't found. Here's a couple of other um, news stories. And these are all from the Ferndale Enterprise. Um, Jim at the Historical Society found them for me. Um, so thank you, Jim. Um, so it kind of gives you a little bit of a, an idea of what the papers were saying about the local Chinese community. Um, and these are in the days following the expulsion. Um, even in Arcata. Um, yeah, and this news story has to do with the... Um, with the claim made against the city, um, which there were other locations that tried to sue their cities for expelling the Chinese populations, especially in, in violent instances. Um, some of those cases did end up working out in the favor of the Chinese, but many of them didn't. Um, and so after the Chinese expulsion here in 1885, this was marketed widely as something called the Eureka Plan. It was lauded as a way to expel the Chinese, have minimal deaths, or in this case, no deaths. Um, and people carried this story with them to other regions that had Chinese people and used um, this as a premise, or a, not as a premise, but as a um, kind of a framework for expelling their Chinese populations. Um, so of course, as the local community here drew on the larger national events that were going on, different Chinese exclusion acts, both state and national, um, other cities and states and towns drew on the example that Eureka had made um, of expelling their Chinese population. So we're all, we're very connected here, even though we are so rural. And um, this last thing I'm going to cover, so this top part of the display, I really wanted to sum up um, what factors led to the 1885 Chinese expulsion and those later events. Because as I was doing this research, I just I had such a hard time grappling with why would a community try to expel an entire community, uh, additional community, within their own. Um, so I kind of summarized it up. You know, economic recession, there was a recession going on. There was a lack of jobs. Um, there was union labor that was agitating to gain support not only for their union efforts, um, but for the expulsion of the Chinese. And then discrimination based on cultural practices, including appearance and language, it makes it very easy to target people that are visibly different. Um, there are racially stereotyped news stories in local and national papers and legalized discrimination. And you'll notice, um, in this picture. So this is a political cartoon along with the other um, picture that we saw. These are both political cartoons. 
uh, demonizing people from China um, as these funky serpents coming out of a black hole um, targeting Lady Liberty, um, who is supposed to be representing California. Um, whereas, you know, these other immigrants coming from other areas are celebrated and welcomed. Um, something really interesting in this one is in memory of Puritanism, um, which I still haven't really figured out what exactly that's supposed to mean. But, um, yeah, so you can see those racial stereotypes show up. Um, here's another one, and this has to do with um, the passing of different anti-Chinese bills, um, and this is on the cover of The Wasp. So this was the cover of a very popular magazine. Um, and you see the white labor destroyers written on his chest there, the, the Chinese man's chest. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of a rundown of this exhibit. Um, this is a really interesting time in our region's history. It's, it's a very kind of dark time in our region's history, but it's something a lot of people don't know about, and that's a big part of why I wanted to put together this exhibit. I'd done a lot of research on this event and wanted to be sure that that information got out about it, and it seemed very relevant. Um, so that's, the, that's kind of my reasoning behind that. So I'd mentioned previously that um, Charlie Moon was uh, a man, a Chinese man who um, was one of the few Chinese people who were not forced out of the county. So that's Charlie Moon right there. This is one of the only pictures we have of him. I have seen other pictures um, in different publications, but so here's here's how this story goes. So. Charlie Moon was working on um, a guy's, Fred Bear's ranch, um, and that was on Redwood Creek. So when the word got out that all the Chinese were being expelled from Eureka, um, a group of men went out to Fred Bear's ranch and said, hey, Fred, we see that you have a Chinese man working for you. He's coming with us. We're sending him to San Francisco. And uh, Fred said, no, you're not. And the mob said, uh, yeah, we are. And then Fred breaks out a shotgun and says, no, you're not. And the group of men says, OK, and they kind of leave. Um, so <laughs> it's kind of a, um, a more flippant retelling of the story. But there are claims that Fred brought a shotgun out and said, no, you're not taking Charlie Moon. He works for me. He is staying here. Um, and he did. So he, uh, Charlie Moon remained at Fred Bear's ranch, worked there for quite some time. Um, and a lot of people, so this story took on a life of its own. So Charlie Moon um, ended up becoming kind of known as the only Chinese man in Humboldt County. And you can kind of see that in this obituary um, from Humboldt Times, 1943. Um, every, a lot of people said, this county has no Chinese people. And then some people would say, well, we have one Chinese guy, his name's Charlie Moon, but he's Americanized. He married a native woman, and he works on this ranch, and he's way out in the middle of nowhere. And um, so it's not really that big of a deal. We basically don't have any Chinese people. Um, but we did. The county definitely had Chinese people. Um, besides Charlie, there are stories of other Chinese men remaining in the county in more rural areas. Um, there's stories of Chinese folks going out to Orleans and staying out there after the expulsion was announced. This is a guy named Billy Bo. We don't have really any information on him besides the fact that he lived out in Wichipec. Um, and I'm not really sure when this picture was taken, maybe the 30s. Um, but yeah, and kind of the things that are also in this case, um, is the souvenir book. So this is a souvenir book that would be given out at things like the Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco, other events where representatives from the county were trying to promote immigration to here. Um, and in this population section, it says, one fact that makes Humboldt unique among the counties of California, and indeed on the Pacific coast, we have no Chinese. Um, and then it kind of goes on to talk about how that happened in 1885. The community rose as a man and drove every Chinese out of the county. No violence was used, but they were compelled to go. And then they say, we have no Chinese people. 
but there's evidence very contrary to the fact. This is a pamphlet that was handed out at the 18, uh, not 1885, the, um, the Panama Pacific International Exposition um, in the, let's see, 1915. Um, and it's just a little you know, potent facts, things that Humboldt has. And then Humboldt County has not Chinese or Japanese, Spanish or railroad grants. Um, and that's really interesting to look into the railroad grants part of that. But um, it has not Chinese or Japanese, which is an outright lie. Um, and I mean, it was a way to promote immigration to Humboldt County by saying, we, have, we don't have these things that other counties have. Um, we have all the good things and not the bad things like the Chinese people. Um, so um, this is kind of sh giving a little bit of a pushback to that long-standing narrative of there being no Chinese people in the county. So for decades and decades after the 1885 expulsion, um, there was not a Chinese community here in Humboldt County, at least not in the cities, um, not in the larger towns. And it wasn't until the 50s even that there were Chinese people coming back to the county. There's stories of um, Chinese people in China, in San Francisco, that if you know you maybe if you were a Chinese person, you were talking to these other people, you said, mm, you know, I might be going to this Northern California part, this, this town of Eureka, people would actively talk you out of it um, because of that long lasting story of the expulsion that happens. And there was, um, there was someone who came here for a talk, um, one of our presentations earlier this year, and she said that um, she was in Chinatown in San Francisco and there was a shop owner who asked her, Oh, where are you visiting from? She says, oh, I'm visiting from Humboldt County, Eureka, you know, that area. And the, the shop owner kind of looks around and says, don't, don't tell anyone here that. Um, they won't serve you. And she said, what? And he says, don't tell anyone you're from Humboldt County. Um, that place has a really bad reputation um, here. So don't, don't say anything. Um, so that story kind of started to turn a little bit. Um, with this guy, Ben Chin. So this is a picture from him in Italy in 1944. So he was born in the same province that many of Eureka's earliest Chinese residents were from, uh, Guangdong province, in 1922. Um, he moved to Portland in 1934 with his grandfather, and they operated a Chinese grocery store. Um, after that, he served in the military for 25 months, and then came back to Portland and um, into the restaurant business. Um, so he did that for a bit, and there were family stories from the Chin family that said that um, Ben had heard about a place in Northern California that might be interested in his restaurant services, and that place was Eureka. So he came to Eureka in 1954 and opened the Canton Cafe. Um, there was a lot of pushback from locals about it. They said, oh, no, not these Chinese people. You know, one guy comes in, we're going to have an entire Chinese group we're going to have to deal with, and we've already kicked everyone out, and we don't want to deal with it. Um, but Ben befriended uh, city councilman Sam Seiko, I think is how you say his last name. He later became, member, became mayor of Eureka, and he was a regular and a supporter of Ben's can, uh, Canton Cafe. Um, and Ben was really brave through this whole, this whole thing. Um, People would call him, they'd say hateful things over the phone. He'd tell them, if you want to talk to me like that, you come in here and you talk to me yourself. Um, and he said that, uh, I don't think anyone actually from one of those phone calls came in and talked angrily at him. But he did have a lot um, facing him in those early years. People kept telling him to leave. Um, so initially the city allowed Chin to operate his restaurant and have one extra um, person who was of Chinese descent um, come and work with him. They were, they were, the city was afraid that this would open doors to a lot of Chinese people and that the townspeople would be angry. So eventually Chin was able to hire more people to work and he sponsored family members in China to come move here to Eureka um, operate the business with them, with him. 
get on their feet and then um, start their own families, their own businesses here in Eureka. Um, so he's a really, really important figure in reestablishing a Chinese community here in Humboldt County through the work he did, through his strength, through the racism that he faced. Um, and we're really honored to uh, have his photo here in the exhibit. Um, he passed away in 2019 at the age of 97 um, after uh, operating his restaurant, having a family, and um, the whole thing. So we're really proud to feature him in this exhibit. So we're going to zoom out a little bit and look at the larger picture of uh, what was going on with Chinese immigration um, nationwide and statewide. Um, so a lot of people mark the Chinese Exclu Exclusion Act of 1882 as the first federal act restricting the immigration of people from a specific country, but it's predated by um, another act called the Page Act of 1875. Um, this act specifically restricted Chinese women from immigrating to the US. Um, and it was marketed as a bill to prevent the immigration of specifically undesirable immigrant women, uh, specifically prostitutes, um, or people who were forced into labor. A lot of times they would just say, if you're forced into labor and you're a woman, you're probably a prostitute, um, and all convicts. So it was enforced specifically against women um, very, very strongly. And there was a couple reasons for that. Um, one of the things that had that kind of had to do with it was that in China, you could get married, men could get married more than once and have multiple wives at the same time. So their first wife would remain in China, manage the household, um, manage the relatives, that kind of thing. And then if you had a second wife, um, the second wife could come with you to the United States. But uh, of course, the US doesn't recognize um, second wives as a legal status. Um, they would just kind of group these second wives into the group of prostitutes. Um, so they would be seen as prostitutes. Um, there were also stories that Chinese women specifically would carry really bad diseases that would kill people. They were specifically carriers of things, um, different venereal diseases. Um, but of course, uh, those diseases are carried by most people, um, not just Chinese people, but um, it was kind of a scapegoat way to blame Chinese women for it. Um, another concern was that Chinese women immigrating to the US could marry white men or have kids with white men, um, and the children would legally become US citizens because they were born on US soil. Um, and that would dilute the whiteness of the country and introduce Chinese customs to the country in more than a temporary way, in a much more permanent way. Um, or even that Chinese women could marry Chinese men and then there would be legal citizens of Chinese descent in the US, which if you were a Chinese citizen and you came to the US, um, you could not become a naturalized citizen like pretty much everyone else. Um, um, and that was a constant battle to deal with because you couldn't have, it, it got very, very murky in terms of what rights you did have, what rights you would sometimes have and then immediately have taken away from you depending on circumstance. Um, so part of the bill, part of what made the bill really effective um, was that it made the process for women to travel from China to the, to the US incredibly, incredibly difficult. There was one part of the process where you had to have a picture of yourself that was sent ahead of time, so you couldn't pretend to be someone else. You had to have that sent to wherever you were gonna be landing in um, most likely California, like San Francisco. Um, and along the way, officials could question you. They could ask you pretty much anything. Um, they would look at your papers to be sure that you were the same person who was cleared to immigrate um, and along the way, if there was an official that didn't see their answers as satisfactory, they could turn them around and send them back to China um, at any time. And there were lots of um, inspectors that would do this routinely. And it severely limited the immigration of uh, women to the United States, Chinese women specifically to the United States um, in the years leading up to the 1882 Big Expulsion Act. Um, Chinese Expulsion Act by the U.S. government. 
And here's some, these are some scans of some paperwork for women immigrating from China to the US. These are all from the Trinity County Historical Society. Um, so these are all women going to Weaverville. And you see there's a stamp here that says person other than laborer um, now residing at Weaverville, Trinity County, California. Um, you know, and that was really important. Women could immigrate if they were not laborers, if they were not prostitutes, and if they were merchants' wives, uh, they could immigrate. Um, and so this is some really interesting paperwork to look at. Here's another one. So this is um, paperwork permitting someone to um, go from China to the U.S. Um, and this was a very big, this was, this came up in a federal court case where there was someone who came from the U.S. or was Chinese, you know, originally born in China. They came to the U.S. and then they went back and they weren't allowed back in. And that was a really big court case that um, uh, impacted Chinese immigration to the U.S. Um, it made it so that um, the, ca the country had to be able to allow these people to come back um, after leaving for temporary uh, purposes.